A big welcome for our first keynote, Dave Farley. Thank you. And I'll, I'll add my welcome to Agile on the Beach to everybody. Um, when I was asked to do the keynote talk, sorry, I'll stand a bit closer to the microphone, that works better, doesn't it? Um, when I was asked to, uh, to, to do this talk, I thought, well, a keynote's a bit different to uh, a regular conference presentation. You, it needs to be a bit, more, a bit broader, a bit more general. And also, you probably want a bit, a bit, something a bit more entertaining at this time in the morning just to start you going and get you into the flavour of the conference. So, so hopefully, I, I, I've tried to do those things. So despite what it says in the programme, this isn't really directly a talk about continuous delivery, although, as you might suspect, given my uh, biases and proclivities, it, it, it leans in that direction. It's more a general thing, and I, and, and I want to plant some thoughts in your head to go away, and, and hopefully they're, they're mildly amusing, but also somewhat philosophical and somewhat useful to you. So, this story starts a long time ago. Uh, a long time ago in a canteen far away, and at the time I kind of I kind of thought that I was this guy or this guy, but actually I think I was probably this guy. Um, and actually it didn't really look like that, but there was a bunch of friends and we were, we were getting together and we were, as you do as friends, we were kind of having one of those jokey conversations where we were trying to put the world to rights and figure out why everything looked quite so screwed up as it did and, and all of those sorts of things. And, and, and this, is, this is a bit more what it really looked like, this, this canteen, and, and there were a bunch of us together and we kind of came up with the, we were coming up with these silly ideas to explain why the world looked the way that it did and in particular why software development looked, looked the way that it did. Uh, more recently, one of the people that was at that conversation, Martin Thompson, uh, put this up uh, in one of his, uh, his, one of his talks, quoting me as saying, as soon as you realise that most people don't know what they're talking about, uh, the world makes a lot more sense. And that was kind of one of the things that kind of came out of this conversation. Uh, actually, he's slightly misquoting me here. So, so he's saying this is Farley's second law. I hadn't quite got to the laws by this point, but, but the laws came. And so, and so the, these, are, these are Farley's three laws. And, and over time, these have kind of be, been, come, become a bit of an in-joke in my family and in, with, amongst my friends. Um, but also, there's, the, 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 there's something in there that's kind of slightly more serious, although they're, they're hopefully slight, mildly humorous. So first of all, first law is people are crap. And I don't mean that in an unpleasant, nasty way. I just mean that we're a bit rubbish. And I'm going to explore this in more detail. The second law, stuff is more complicated than you think. You know, everything, as soon as you start looking at it in more detail, starts getting harder to understand and harder to figure out what's going on. And the last one is, I, I argue most over this one, that mostly people tend to agree with the first two. But all stuff is interesting, uh, as long as you look at it in the right way. The, the challenge that's usually put up to me is, yeah, but what about EastEnders? And I say, well, I, f I find it very interesting that EastEnders is so popular, so that's one way of looking at it. But... So, let's, so let's explore this in a bit more detail. And as I said, I don't mean this in an unpleasant way. We're just odd. We're, we're, we're not as good as we think we are. We do all sorts of silly things. And I, I particularly like this one. What, what, what is she thinking? And this one, was a spaceship broken, waiting for parts. Actually, what I had in mind was more like this. <laughs> I, think, I think that all of these are real, except that one. <laughs> I, 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 like, I like the body language of this guy. <laughs> he's, he's just there thinking, <laughs> what do I do now? This is kind of my caricature of how I think of humanity. <laughs> we're, 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 kind of, we're kind of dangerous, but, but don't, you know, we're, we're only vaguely competent. <laughs> so, so, so as I said, I, I don't mean this in an aggressive, nasty way when I say that people are crap. I mean just that we're a bit, a bit rubbish. We're not as good as we think we are. We're, we're certainly not nowhere near as close to rational as we think we are. And I'm going to show you a few things to try and demonstrate this. So first of all, does anybody know what, what, what's, the, what's the most, uh, the strongest predictor that you're going to be able to convince somebody of your ideas in a meeting? 
correct. <laughs> it's food. It's the quality of the food. Psychology experiments show that no matter how good your arguments, how flashy your presentation, how, how well you present these things, the best predictor of whether people will agree with you after the meeting is the quality of the food that you provide at the meeting. If you go with great biscuits to the meeting, you're going to convince people of your ideas. You know, there's, there's, there's something that chimes kind of with Pavlov's dogs here and, and, and all that kind of things. We, you know, we're, we're, we're biological beings. We've evolved to care. You know, there's, there's the hierarchy of needs and food is well up there above um, organisational strategy or, or, you know, team building. <laughs> Our strongest sense is vision. And so, you know, there's, there's the seeing is believing is the common, the common sort of... But, but, but actually, most of our perception of the world is largely in our brains. What we perceive of as reality is not really real. And that there are lots of ways of demonstrating this, and I'm going to show you a few. So, so first of all, did anybody notice that I, people are poor observers? I misspelt that. Okay, so here's, here's a little video. Oh, that's a bit weird. <laughs> so you're all now theorising about some weird thing with magnets or something like that that's making this work. At least I was the first time I saw this. Actually, it's just a matter of perspective. Here's, here's another one. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to simplify this for you a little bit. So, so this is the same effect. So, so here's, 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 a, here's a grid, uh, clearly made of uh, different coloured squares. Uh, and all I've done is move, I've, I've just moved square A to be alongside square B. And look, they're the same colour. We don't see colours as absolutes. What we do is that we, we look at differences and our brain paints the picture for us. So what we're doing in this picture is that we're saying there's, there's this big thing here and that's casting a shadow. That means that the, the colour density uh, on these things within the shadow is going to be different to the, these things there and therefore our brain decides what colours those things are. That's, that's, it's, that's more complicated than you think, right? Here's another one. Can you see that? Hopefully, hopefully if this, this effect has worked, you've kind of seen now a union jacking true colours. There's nothing there. What's happening now is that the, the latency in the, the chemical processing in the, the sensors inside your eyes is slow, and so it's delayed. The first thing kind of programmed in a certain set of chemical reactions in the co rods and cones in your eyes, and now the, the, that, that, that's hanging on, and I'm just showing you a white piece of paper and you see a union jack. Here's an even weirder one. So keep, look, keep looking at the dot. Now, if you look at the dot, the picture's in colour. If you look away from the dot, it's in black and white. <coughs> the picture is black and white. The colour is being made up by your brain. <coughs> this is a still image uh, for... for, for a bunch of you in the audience, most of you I would imagine, I, would, I think that you'll see it moving. Uh, that's because of an effect in the way that your eyes work, in the, or your eyes constantly scan. And they, they scan the visual field. Uh, and what's happening is that your, as your eyes are scanning, they keep coming back. And because of the way these colours work and the pattern works, your, eyes, your brain thinks that it's moving. And, and this is just repeating. I just thought this was a cool picture as well. This is repeating the same effect as I showed before. 
So if I blank out that, they're the same colour again. So our, so our perception of reality is, is kind of not what we think it is. This, I, I, I don't know why this is, this is a remarkably simple one, uh, uh, but I really like this. As, as you look, your, uh, this again shows the, the, the movement of your eyes, and you'll see little black dots, see where there are white dots, uh, just as your eyes move around the, the, the field. And, and here's you know, uh, a skilled artist, a uh, particular take on perspective, and, and you get this kind of effect. We, 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 it's too easy to fool ourselves. We can, it, it's, it, it's very simple for us to fool ourselves because of the way in which we perceive reality. Now, some of this is explained by the, the physiology of our eyes. So, so you can talk about effects like the, the, the fact that right in the middle of our visual field and the back of our retina, retina is the place where the optic nerve comes out. And so there's a big black spot, blank spot, in the middle of your visual field. And you can, you can, there, there are optical illusions that kind of play with this and you can kind of hide things in the, in the black spot and stuff like this. In what really happens is that actually there's a tiny little field of vision within your eyes that that mostly you see. And as I said, your eyes, your brain makes your eyes sort of skitter around uh, and you build up the field, kind of, you sample it bit by bit over time. Um, experiments suggest, so as, as, your, as your eyes move, as, you, as they, they call them, they're called saccades or something like, I'm not quite sure I'm pronouncing that right, but they, that's what they call the little movements of your eyes. As these things take part, your brain switches off your visual field. So what you're doing is that you're sampling the image and you're painting a picture that kind of gives reality. So what we're, what we're perceiving as reality is actually a, a series of digital samples of, of, of the scene that you build up over time. Scientists have estimated that the, your time to paint the whole picture is in the order of two to three seconds. That's remarkably slow. That means that mostly what we perceive as reality through our vision is entirely made up by our brains. We're just guessing at what's going on. You know, we, 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 we last looked up here two or three seconds ago, so we're just assuming that what's happened there has moved on and we just, our brain is kind of a mental model and it's playing with, with us and fooling us as, as to our perception of reality. Here's another. So I, my, I, I guarantee that everybody in the audience is seeing this as a person walking. Can, 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 you, can, you, can you tell me what sex this person is? Male. Male. I, th I think mostly, most of us would agree that this looks like a man walking. Actually, it's just a bunch of dots animated. There's no person there. Our brain is, is filling in all of this detail and telling us stuff that isn't there. We do this with sound too. Here's an interesting experiment. I'm going to play you some sounds that are made purely with sine waves. And if you haven't heard these before, you're probably not going to be able to understand what they do. After that, I'm going to play you a, the same phrase in normal speech and then play you the sine waves again. And, and pretty much for the rest of your life, you would hear that sine wave sound as though it's, it's normal speech. Your brain is that good at this sort of pattern matching. So. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The man read the newspaper at lunchtime. The man read the newspaper at lunchtime. The man read the newspaper at lunchtime. He was sitting at his desk in his office. He was sitting at his desk in his office. He was sitting at his desk in his office. That's amazing, isn't it? It's, it's amazing the way that your brain fills in all of the detail that isn't there. Our other senses are, ju are, are, are just the same. If, if, you, if you look at measuring touch and, and so on, we're not as sensitive as we think we are. Even the most sensitive parts of our body can only differentiate two points, kind of two or three millimetres apart. Our tongue, I think, is the most sensitive part, and that's 1.5 millimetres apart, apart. You can discriminate touch. That's, that's, you know, that's this much. Parts of your body, you know, it's, it, it's this far apart. You can't tell t two points touching you this far apart. You can't tell them apart. It gets even weirder when you start looking at cognition and the way that the brain really processes things and the way that it works. So here's, I, I'm going I'm to show you pictures 
of, of, uh, of words and I want you to tell me the colour of the words, not what the word says. <laughs> that screws with your mind, doesn't it? <laughs> so what's happening there is, is that, our pro of course, if you show this to toddlers before they've learnt to read, they can do this, no problem, <laughs> because they only see the colours. But as soon as you learn to read, it's, that's a higher order function, and that, in our, the way that our brains work, that takes precedence over the dissection of colours. So, so reading comes first. So, that, so we'll, we'll tend to shout out what the word actually says rather than the colour of the word because for words, that's generally more important. That's what we've learned. It's what they say, not, what they, not the colour that they're, they're, they're drawn in. So, so now I, I, I'm going to let's talk a little bit more about time and the way in which we perceive reality in terms of time. Let's imagine that you're standing at the end of a tennis court and Andy Murray's at the other end, and he's just served served a ball at you. How much time have you got to react to to his serve? So let's say he's having an off day, uh, and it's his second serve, and so he's serving it about 100 miles an hour. It, it just makes the maths easier. Okay. So 100 miles an hour is about 45 meters per second. And the speed of light is roughly 300 million meters per second. Which, which I, I kind of like, I, I'm, a, I'm a nerd, so I kind of like the fact that what that boils down to is that one nanosecond is about one foot. So light will travel one foot in a nanosecond. There's something that's kind of nice about that. <laughs> So, the length of a tennis court is 78 feet, so, you, so at the, the speed of light tells us that the best that you could possibly, if you had instantaneous reactions, the best that you could possibly do is, is that you could react in, 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 in 78 nanoseconds after he's hit the ball, because the speed of light's going to take that long to get to the other end of the court. Of course, we need to worry about how fast the ball's going more than the speed of light. So here's, here's our eye, we've got light arriving from Andy's serve at the other end of the court, and that's taking 78 nanoseconds. Then we've got the distance, so we've got 78 feet, light taking 78 nanoseconds, now we've got the distance from here to here. Okay, how long is that going to take? That's take about 15 milliseconds. If you've done any low latency programming, that's remarkably slow. <laughs> you, can do, you can do thousands of trades if you're doing low, low latency trading or something like that in this time. You know, this, is, this, is a, this is very, very slow in computer terms, but it takes about 15 milliseconds to get from your eye down your optic nerve to the subconscious part of your brain. The bit to go from your subconscious part of your brain to the conscious part of your brain, when you say, ah, I know what's going on, that takes a staggering 300 milliseconds, a third of a second. For simplicity, it, it's actually in a range. It's in the order of about 200 milliseconds to about 300. Uh, it takes longer than that to send an impulse to your, um, to your muscles to make you move to return Andy serve. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to factor that in. I'm going I'm, I'm to let's assume that it's just a matter of recognising the, the, the ball. So that means that our time to react is the sum of all of these parts. We've got 78 nanoseconds and 315 milliseconds in order to react. So how, what does that mean in distance? It means that the last moment that we can make that we can perceive the ball before we have time to react and, and do something conscious is 46 feet. That's still his, the ball is still his side of the tennis court. It hasn't hit the ground yet before you've got to have sent the signal to, to react. They've done experiments with professional football players, Cristiano Ronaldo, where they would, they would cross a ball and, they would, and he would volley it into the net and then they would turn the lights off. 
And what's happening is that these people are, are guessing what's going to happen. They're making it up. This is not reality. They're not watching the ball and carefully responding. They've trained themselves and they've kind of optimised the, the path through this process so that they've, they've, they've managed to learn how to, to slightly speed up their reactions. But still, the, the, the biological systems that make us up are not going to wait. You're not going to wait and kind of perceive where the ball is and bring your racket to meet it. That's not how it works. You're going to guess where it's going to arrive and you're going to take a wild swing at it and hopefully they connect and mostly if you're a good sportsman they do there are some fundamentals in here in terms of the way that our neuroscience works so I'm going to put up a couple of calculations so there's the first one and there's the second one my bet is that in your brain you had two very different responses to those calculations the first one your subconscious mind will have presented the answer to you, to your conscious mind, without any intervention. It will have come to you very quickly. The second one, what's probably happening is that you thought, do I know the answer to that? No, I don't. Uh, shall I work it out? Uh, no, I won't. Shall I wait for Dave to tell me the answer? <laughs> That's, that's the way that we tend to work. And there, there are really good reasons for this. Here's, here's, another, here's another one on the same vein. So I'd like you all to cross your, fold your arms, cross your arms. Okay. Now do it the other way around. The, the second way around feels weird, right? It, it's slower. It, 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 it's a more deliberate action. This is the difference between what neuroscience called called system one and system two thinking, or, or colloquially fast and slow thinking. Our brains work in two very different modes. And the vast majority of decisions are, are based on, on what system one thinking, fast thinking. Fast thinking is purely kind of conditioned reflex. It's not, it's not conscious at all. We will just react and we will make a decision. And this isn't just about folding your arms or doing a calculation. The, the, we make choices on this basis in our lives. We decide about the ways in which we're going to work. We decide what we're going to write a test for if we're writing, doing test-driven development. We decide, ha, ha, make design choices on the basis of this, based purely on experience, what we've seen before, without really thinking carefully about what's going on. And there are good reasons for this. If, I love this picture. If you do an fMRI scan of people's brains when they're doing system one thinking and system two thinking, you get two entirely different pictures. System one thinking, that's the fast one, you can see that you light up this tiny area of your brain. System two thinking, it lights up your brain like a, I don't know what, <laughs> something very bright. You're using more energy. You're burning more sugar. You're, 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 this, this, this takes deliberate action. It's also dramatically slower. System one thinking is the stuff that we were talking about when we were talking about Andy Murray's serve. That's in the order of milliseconds. This takes two or three seconds for us to do this kind of work. We are biologically programmed to, to be lazy and to avoid this. It uses more energy. But this is, what, this is where rational thought lives. This is where irrational jumping to conclusions lives. I, I like this quote, belief comes easily, doubt takes effort. So, so we're presented with a bunch of problems. If what I'm saying, if, if my laws um, are, are correct uh, and Given the bounds of them being mostly humorous, they are, I think they are correct. Um, then we've got these, these problems to con con contend with. We are poor observers. We, we, we don't really perceive reality and we fool ourselves that what we are perceiving is reality all of the time. We, we work on the basis of confirmation bias. We'll, 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 make, um, we'll, we'll search for the information to back up our theories rather than for the information that doesn't back up our theories. We'll, when we get information, we'll, we'll selectively choose the bits that, that reinforce what we already thought. Um, we, we, we forget, we selectively discard the things that don't really fit with our theories of the world. We tend to, in groups, we tend to polarise opinion, we tend to all agree and we all tend to go, drift off in one wrong direction. And we will stick with ridiculous, incorrect beliefs 
for very long periods of time. There's the classic story about, you know, we're, we're, we're agile on the beach. We're, to, we're, we're here to talk about agile development practices and all that kind of stuff. So, so you've probably heard that um, when, uh, when, when the man that invented uh, waterfall invented it, he invented it as um, an anti-pattern. He, he, he was describing something that he didn't think worked. Hey, I, I, I was interested and I went and looked up the original paper in which he published the, the Waterfalls um, story. And you all know the classic sort of stepladder waterfall diagram that sort of describes the process in different stages. The very next paragraph, the very next paragraph after that diagram in his paper says, this doesn't work. <laughs> And yet, our industry has been populated by the belief that waterfall is the right way to do things for two or three decades. So, <laughs> four, thank you. Uh, we have all of these, all of these kinds of failings. Uh, this, is, this is a little video that demonstrates several of these kind of social failings of us as human beings. This is an American football match. Just, just, just watch this. It's, it's kind of I'll, turn the, I'll turn the sound off because the sound plays no part. Very smart, right? <laughs> there's, 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 a, there's a great bit when, when if you... <laughs> one, one of the bit, the, the persistence of, dis, of discredited belief, there's one bit, there's, where, where there's one, of, one of the defenders, some of his mates are already chasing the guy that's running and he's still standing there. He could have stopped him. He's still standing there watching him run past. That's crazy. So, so, so what's the point of all this? Why, why am I just, am I just beating up on human beings? Uh, of course not, some of my best friends are human beings. <laughs> my, 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 my point here is that the way that we defend against these psych inbuilt psychological deficiencies in our makeup is science. Science is the best invention that mankind has ever, has ever invented. It's, it, it's, 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 it's our strongest problem solving technique. So, so what, what do I mean by that? Does anybody know who this is? Richard Feynman. For those of you that, that, that aren't familiar with Richard Feynman, Richard, I, I, I am not a person that has, he, has heroes, but Richard Feynman is, is one of my heroes. He, he is, without any doubt, without a shadow of a doubt, one of the finest minds of the 20th century. <coughs> He's a, stag a genuine genius, a theoretical physicist. He was involved in the, the Los Alamos project to make the atom bomb. He came up with the theory called quantum electrodynamics, which is the most accurate predictor that human beings have ever created. It's a more accurate theory than uh, Einstein's general relativity. But on top of all that, he was a wonderful phil uh, talker on the philosophy of science. And, and I've just nicked a few, a few quotes to kind of talk about this. So, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. So, science is not about just trusting what somebody tells you and doing it because that, that's what they say. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you're the easiest person to fool. That's part of what I'm talking about in terms of these, these cognitive biases. We have to find a way to avoid fooling ourselves, not just at the perceptual level, but at the cognitive level, not jumping to conclusions, not being sceptical about the assumptions that, that we reach and figuring out how we can test them and deal with them. And, and this, is, this is one of my, my favourites, the last one. If it, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, if you guess, and that guess cannot be backed up by experimental evidence, then it's still a guess. And this is by one of the finest minds that humanity has ever produced. So if he can say that, I think it's true of all the rest of us. So what am I talking about? I'm not talking about the outputs of science. I'm not talking about the need for large hadron colliders I'm talking, and, and space shuttles. I'm talking about the simple idea that, of the scientific method. If we want to defend ourselves against our abilities to, to screw up and to make mistakes, then we need to, to think carefully about how we evaluate the things that, that we want to learn. So the scientific method, this, this is what Wikipedia's description, so make a guess based on experience and observation, propose an explanation, make a prediction from the hypothesis, test the prediction, and repeat. And that repeat is a vital aspect. I hope. 
I believe well, one of the reasons that I, I, I bang on about this stuff and one of the reasons that I'm talking to you guys about this stuff is that I think that this is the reason why agile development practices in general and continuous delivery specifically, I think this is why they work. I think that if you apply the scientific method and um, incremental rational uh, uh, decision making to weed out ideas, you end up with agile development, lean processes, continuous delivery. Those are kind of an inevitable outcome because that's how you optimise. That's, that's the optimal, the, oops, those are optimal solutions for the, the problems that we are trying to solve. But being experimental isn't, isn't easy. Has anybody seen this before? So this is a, a, a classic optical illusions, and the, the, the obvious question is, which is the larger dot? The, which, the orange dot, which is, which is the bigger, the, the one on the right or the one on the left? Show of hands for the one on the right. Ah. <laughs> one on the left? No? Okay, you don't trust me now. Good. <laughs> So a simple experiment, I'll draw some lines in, and they're the, both the same size, it's an optical illusion. This one, have you seen this one before? Yeah? Okay. So which, which one's the bigger line, the one on the right or the one on the left? One on the right? Okay, one on the left. I cheated. <laughs> we can't tell. Without, without doing the experiment, we can't tell. Another of my, my favourite nerdisms is I'm interested in aviation and space travel and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I want to tell you a little story about being experimental and what, uh, and what that means. Uh, so in, in 61, Kennedy said, we're going to send a man to the moon. And all of the NASA scientists went, gulp. <laughs> because they didn't know anything. They didn't know about, they, they hadn't got a model for how they would get there. They didn't know about uh, whether they would need multi-stage vehicles to get there or, or, or a single thing that would just go all of the way and, and come. They had no clue. Those, those ideas hadn't corrupt up yet. At this point, America hadn't put a man, even, Alan Shepard hadn't even done his suborbital lob, so let alone somebody in orbit. There wasn't an American that had been into space yet. So, so here's the vision. They want to put a man on the moon. And here's the stuff that they don't know. Everything about putting a man on the moon. None of this stuff was worked out. They didn't even have a, a plan at this point. So, so where, where do you start? And I, and I, th I think many, if you're like me, many of us that, that think about NASA, think about them being very deliberate and very planned and all that kind of stuff, and they're going to come up with all these detailed specifications for how they're going to do things and all this kind of thing. And, and there's, there's truth to that. They certainly do that. And, but you, you also need to keep the vision in mind. You also need to keep in mind what's going on. So let's look at the problem and break it down into some smaller steps. So here's the Earth-Moon system. That's the kind of classic picture of the, the, what you think of when you think about the Earth and the Moon. Except that's not real. This is more what it's like. This is, this is more to scale. And at the point, remember, that no human being had been as far as a pixel away from the Earth. So, so now, no, no vehicle had been more than a pixel away from the Earth at the point at which they're planning to do this. So now they figure, so, so what, what are the experiments? How can you decompose this into small steps to figure out what to do? So they started thinking, so, you know, so what's the first thing we need to do? Said, well, 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 what we need to do is that we need to send a spaceship out to, to the moon and, and bring it back. So it doesn't have to be a manned spaceship, we, can, we just send a spaceship out. And you think, well, that's, that's not the minimum experiment that we could do. We could just send a spaceship and land it on the moon. Well, that's not the minimum experiment. We could just send a spaceship and crash it onto the moon. So, so we're just shooting spaceships as bullets at the moon, <laughs> is our first experiment. And that's what this program was about. This is the Ranger program. So that, this is precisely what the Ranger program was designed to do. The goal was to launch a spaceship and hit the moon. So Ranger 1, the, the first step was to get Ranger 1 into orbit. And that the, the first mission was to get it into orbit. And it blew up on launch. Ranger 2 also blew up on launch. Ranger 3 
right into orbit, but, but by, by now, because they'd, they were getting behind, they decided to go further, they were actually going to fire this one at the moon. So they got it into orbit successfully, and they deorbited Earth and did the parabolic shot to get it towards the moon, and they missed the moon. Ranger 4 hit the moon, but the, the systems failed before it had left Earth orbit, so they had no data. <laughs> but they think it hit the moon. <laughs> Ranger 5 missed. <laughs> Ranger 6 impacted the moon, but the cameras had failed. <laughs> Ranger 7 was a success. It achieved all of its mission objectives. They'd refined what they were doing. They were learning from all of these mistakes. Ranger 8 was a success. Ranger 9 was a success. So we think of, we think of science as being deliberate and planned. It's not. It's experimental, it's, and being experimental means that stuff will go wrong all of the time. And actually, if you think about the philosophy of that, what that really means is that that's the time when you learn. If your prediction, if you design an experiment and, and your prediction comes true, all of you've done is you've reinforced your prejudices. If you carry out an experiment and it goes wrong, you've learned something new. And now you think, oh... What happens next? So, uh, so, so the trick is to find ways of doing experiment where, where the costs aren't too high. In this case, they could have decided just to fire a man at, you know, and tried, and tried to get in there, but they would have killed him. They would have killed several people if they'd done that. They found a way of reducing the cost of doing these, carrying out these experiments. Being experimental works. There's a classic psych experiment in psychology called the Marshmallow Challenge. And I, I've done this on, 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 on training, I've, I've run this on training courses, and it's a lot of fun. The, 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 the idea is, is that you, you have 20 sticks of spaghetti, a metre of tape, a metre of string, and one marshmallow. And the jo you divide the group up into, into teams, and the job is to build the tallest tower to suspend a marshmallow. Okay? What's interesting are the results. So you get all sorts of weird constructions, and that's interesting, but people have carried out these experiments lots and lots of times, and they've collected the results, and this is the, this is, these are the result. this is what comes out of it. So CEOs, leaders of companies, do quite well. But interestingly, if you partner CEOs with executive assistants, they do even better. The reason for this is that what, what most adults tend to do is that they, they tend to start the, the process by, okay, so they, they do the politics thing. So who's going to be in charge? So who's going to, who's going to run this? Who's, 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 going to, who's going to be the ideas person? Who's going to coordinate the effort? Who's going to allocate the work? And they have this little negotiation in their teams to figure out, to divide up the work. That's what generally happens. And while you're doing that, if you have a facilitator in place to coordinate that exercise and keep it on track, that goes more efficiently and wastes less time. As you'd expect, engineers do well because they understand structures and stresses and all that kind of stuff, so they tend to do well. But the really surprising group are these. These are kindergarten children. <laughs> and kindergarten, ch kindergarten children are the third best at, at doing this. And the reason is because what tends to happen with most adults is that most adults will plan, they'll draw some pictures, they'll figure out the structure that they're going to build, then they'll go and build that, and they'll build it, they'll put the marshmallow on top and it'll fall over. What the kindergarten kids do is that they'll build the simplest possible little tripod of sticks and put the marshmallow on the top. And then they'll, they'll make it higher and they'll iterate and they'll advance and they'll experiment and they'll learn from each experiment. And so just purely through the experimental process, they will outdo uh, lawyers, business school students and the average punter, the, the software engineers and people like us that are likely to turn up and do this kind of thing. Experimentation works. Does there, do people know that, well, I say who this is, Edwards Deming. Edward, Edwards Deming, so, so this is the man that kind of revolutionised um, uh, production uh, technology in Jap Japan after the war. And, and for those of you that are old enough that remember Japan as kind of the, the powerhouse economy of the late 20th century, it's, a lot of that was down to the work of Edwards Deming. And what he did was he did a conscious lift of the scientific method and applied it to process. And he came up with a plan, do, study, act model. And this ought to be ringing bells. This ought to be sounding familiar to you because this is the scientific method just kind of described in a slightly different way. So if we want to do, if we want to do things, we want to 
plan a change or a test aimed at improvement. We want to carry out the change or test, preferably on a small scale, so that if it goes wrong, it's not going to kill us. Uh, we want to study the results of what happened and what went wrong, what did we learn, what went wrong. And we want to adapt to the change or abandon it, depending on what we learned, and repeat. And the repeat part is crucial. That's why we have iterations. That's why we have, that's why we work in iterative cycles. That's why we establish feedback loops in our development processes. <coughs> Another way of looking at this is there's a good book called the Toyota Improvement Carter. What we can do is we can use deliberate practice to train ourselves to think more scientifically, to be more experimental. And this is, there's, there's a great story about the guy that came up with this, Mike Rother, who is um, uh, an analyst at Mich Michigan University, a professor at Michigan University, who studied lean manufacturing processes. And every year, he would get, him and a bunch of others would go over to Toyota and study what Toyota did, and then they'd come back and they'd go to the American car industry, this is what Toyota are doing. And the American car industry would try and copy it, and then they'd go back to Toyota and Toyota weren't doing it anymore. So after a while, <laughs> they stopped and thought, there's something else going on here. And they studied this more deeply and started looking. And actually, what, you know, what Toyota were really doing is that they were being experimental. It wasn't the individual practice. It wasn't the Andon cords or the, the Kanban boards or the stand-up meetings that were the, the vital things. It was being experimental that were the vital things. It was trying things out, seeing what happened, learning from what you found that really mattered. And so he came up with this... This, this carter, a carter is a, pr a process of repeated actions. It comes from the learning martial arts where you learn specific moves over and over and over again to, to kind of channel in your brain uh, to, to, to move uh, choices from system two thinking to system one thinking is one way of thinking about what a carter does. And you can, you can apply this to becoming experimental. You can carry out carters to train yourself to become more experimental. I'm going to skip over this because I'm starting to run a little bit lower on time. If you start thinking about um, the things that we're all here to discover, learn about, contribute uh, uh, over these, this couple of days, agile thinking and lean thinking, start thinking about, and placing this in the context of science and experimentation, I think it starts to make more sense. I think it starts to describe why it is that this stuff works. So if you think about the lean mindset, you know, not all of these things are directly related, but they're kind of aligned. We're looking to deliver things quickly. We want, we want to get an early result. That means that we're looking to make small changes. That means that they're lower risk. That means that we're, when our experiments go wrong, that's okay. We want to look at building high quality and we, we want to be rigorous about the way that we think about these things. We want to be intellectually specific about the outcomes that we envisage and we want to try and make, it, make our experiments as controlled as we can to make sure that, that what we're learning is really what we're learning and we just not jump into conclusions because of some, some um, non-causal side effect. We want to listen to the. We want to look, listen to, look for feedback loops and and try and establish those. And we want to look to optimise the ways in which we work to make ourselves efficient. Continuous delivery was absolutely informed by these ideas. I know because you know the, the principles that we came up with. You know, we were writing these these things down and. You know, we're trying so that the the first principle from from the continuous delivery book says we're trying to create a repeatable, reliable process for releasing software. It needs to be repeatable. It needs to be reliable. It needs to be give us the framework that allows us to carry out these small, low risk experiments. So, you, so, you, so I, I've kind of, I've kind of been talking a lot about kind of philosophy of science. Position this a little bit more for us, for our industry, for the things that that we know about and deal with. So, here are some examples of where stuff was more complicated than the people involved thought. We're talking about serious implications here. We're not talking about just having the project, project manager on your case because you, you were late or whatever. We're talking about having real impact. So 
Ariane 5 explodes 40 seconds after launch. That's because it was using some old software and there was, a, there was a, an integer. I think it was one had 32-bit integers, the other had 64-bit integers, and the, the, the software with the 64-bit integers called some software that had 32-bit integers, and there was an overflow and the, the number wrapped, and the spaceship blew up. Um, people were treated, people were dosed with gamma radiation because um, software went wrong. It's something I, I actually worked for the company after this happened, trying to help them improve uh, their software development process. But Knight Capital lost nearly half a billion dollars in a few minutes because there was some out of date software in production that, that got called when it shouldn't have been. And I, I didn't know this uh, this one until I looked uh, until I was doing the research to, uh, around this stuff. But in 1983, there was a Russian colonel who was in charge of Russian's missile nuclear missile defence, and all of the systems, because of a bug in those systems, were telling him that there was an inbound attack from the United States. And I don't know why, but he didn't believe them. He decided not to believe them. And we're all here as a result of his decision not to retaliate to a strike that his systems were telling him was real. This stuff matters. We need to... We, software, software has... is not just about a bottom line advantage to commercial companies. People's lives depend on this stuff. We need to be more rigorous. We need to be more deliberate. We need to be more cautious in the way in which we do this sort of stuff. As an interesting side effect, when we work that way, we, become more, we also become more efficient. So actually, it's a commercial advantage as well. If you want to know more about that, my talk after this about continuous delivery, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's another example. So this is the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Okay? So in 1982, uh, the index the, the, for this stock exchange was initialized at a value of 1,000. Might as well start at a nice round number. And it was then updated with every trade, um, and, and the, the, trades were the, the, the value of the index was rounded to three decimal places. And this was kind of five times, this happened sort of 5,000, uh, sorry, 3,000 times a day. The truncation led to around 25 points per month drift in the value of the stock exchange. When eventually they got to fixing this problem, two years later, when the error was corrected and they, 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 correct, they looked back and historically corrected, it nearly doubled the value of the stock exchange. So we need to think about this stuff carefully. We need to be very... There are subtle things going on here that, that can catch us out if we are not deliberate, more scientific, more rational in our approach to doing these sorts of things. I tend to think of software development as, um, a, as, as a process of a series of interlocking feedback loops. And the establishment of these feedback loops is crucial, and the, 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 their utility is, is vital. So this is kind of the classic picture that I tend to draw when I'm talking about continuous delivery. So, so the most important feedback loop is the feedback loop from having an idea getting that idea in the form of useful, valuable, working software into the hands of our customers and figuring out what they make of it. That's the first principle of the Agile Manifesto. That's, that's the, and that, that's our highest priority. That's, that's what we're all here to do. That's our job, is to get good software to our users and learn from what we find. I believe that if you optimize your process for that. If you carry out a, uh, a, a, a series of deliberate, a, a course of deliberate experimentation to optimize that process, the whole of agile theory, the whole of lean theory, the whole of continuous delivery falls out as a consequence of those two ideas. Shorten the cycle time, be experimental, and that's it. All of the rest, all of the automation, all of the configuration management, all of the team uh, structures, all of the breaking down of barriers that DevOps, DevOps tells us about, all of that stuff, you have to do that stuff if you want to so shorten that cycle time and be reliable and repeatable. 
So here, here, here's, here is kind of three classic feedback loops. There are more feedback loops than this, but so we, you know we're talking about the experiments in production. We're able to put something out there, see what the users make of it, and and at the level of the business decide what to do next. From our point of view as technologists, we're looking to, to facilitate that through, through using acceptance testing and validate that the story, the, the, the requirements are filled. And at the inside of, the, of that, that onion of feedback loops is kind of the TDD cycle where we're, we're, we're working, as developers, we're working in this small, fine-grained, iterative cycle to validate the, our own work. So, um, uh, Bo uh, Robert C. Martin says that TDD is to software development what double entry bookkeeping is to accountancy. That's our only way of knowing that, we're, that the code that we're writing is good. Everything else is a guess. And remember what Feynman said. Now there are lots, there's lots more to it than just these feedback loops, but all of these things are kind of part of that and they're kind of reinforced by having the feedback and having the ability to learn and adapt. There's also another dimension to this. There's the human dimension. And so we can think about the feedback loops there and, and agile processes are about trying to maximise our ability. One of my favourite sound bites at the moment from, from, from lean thinking is that you should be optimising for learning, not for delivery. If you optimise for learning, you will get better, more efficient, and you will deliver better as a consequence of that. But if you optimise for delivery, you tend to go down the wrong road and you tend not to spend the time improving your, 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 um, your processes and making yourselves more efficient. So, if you want to be experimental, so we can't jump to conclusions. We, we, we can't just start work based on a guess. We don't want to do things because that's the way that we've always done them. There should be no sacred cows. We should be able to question everything. The technology, process, structure, the people that are involved. Have we got the right people doing the right jobs? Team structure, team organisation. Are we building the right things for our customers? Is it what they really want? Everything should be up for grabs. And the, the, if you look at the best organisations, the... The, the, the Googles, the Netflixes, the Spotify's of the world. This is the sort of thing that they do. This is how they target their products at, at, at their customers. We do want to question everything. We want to make your first response to any idea, how can I test this? We want to work iteratively so that we can learn, learn and adapt. And we want to think about how to apply ideas from science all of these, I, I, I have used all of these ideas in, in, in develop, you know, changed, moved about, but all of these ideas I've found apply to software development. Falsifiability, the sceptical mind, scientific method, reproducibility, peer review, all of these things chime and they work when we do them in, in, in science. I want to remind, this is just another excuse for me to be self-indulgent because Feynman's my hero. I want to remind you of Feynman's thoughts. We should be applying this to everything that we do. We should be applying this kind of thinking to our work all of the time. So we're approaching the end of my presentation now. And I think I know the question that's in your mind because I talked about the first law, people are crap. The second law, stuff's more complicated than you think. And I said there were three laws. Well, I hope this presentation has demonstrated all three. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. <laughs> so, I want you to go away and take this with you. I'm not suggesting that these are things that, uh, uh, that you need to start a religion about, but... <laughs> Farley's three laws. Thank you very much.